All right, everyone, welcome back to the Ramp Podcast. Today, I am joined with a special guest, one of our favorites from Northwestern Mutual, Tim Guerin. Tim, welcome to the show. Danny, great to be here. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. So we're deviating a little bit from our podcast, asking sales leaders those five questions we ask every time to speak with Tim about the future of work. Tim is an innovator and a pioneer and has thought through many, many obstacles that have come or have come up with the future of work, and we're hitting them at a good time. The macroeconomic tailwinds are all over the place, so Tim is going to shed some light on what is happening with our world and where work is going. Sounds great. Awesome. So let's get started, Tim. Before we jump into some of the questions, I just want to know, who is Tim Garand? All right. Well, I'll give you the uh, Reader's Digest version. I graduated from Butler many years ago. I was an economics major, went straight from there to law school at Notre Dame, had a great experience there. I won't comment on any of your Michigan paraphernalia in the back. We'll leave that for another time. But in addition to getting a good education, I met my uh, to-be wife there. So that was good. Following Notre Dame, I practiced with a large national law firm that was based in Chicago called Cypher Shaw. And I'm happy to talk about that a little bit. I think I learned a lot, worked with some amazing people, but I also decided that isn't what I wanted to do forever. And a little bit after 9-11, I had an opportunity to be invited to join the law department at Northwestern Mutual. So for family and business reasons, I made the move from Chicago to Milwaukee and from a big law firm to an in-house role. And part of that was, as I said, it was family and business related. I would say I also was an intentional choice by me. I wanted to be at a place where I really identified with the purpose and values of the organization, Northwestern Mutual. You know, for your listeners who aren't familiar with us, is a mutual company. So it's owned by its policy owners, very values driven, been around a long time. And and I also wanted to be involved more with the business. So while I, I joined in a legal role, I worked really closely with the business. And then I progressed through a variety of roles in the law department and ultimately was fortunate to have the opportunity to leave the law department and operate in a number of different business roles. And for most of the last decade, I've had the privilege of working with our advisors and field leaders all across the country. And today, my responsibility is to make sure that our advisors and field leaders have everything that they need to be successful in the marketplace where they're in the business of providing financial advice and financial securities to you know clients and customers. You talked about the macroeconomic environment. It's pretty crazy out there. People need advice and need help. And my job is to make sure that our advisors and leaders have everything they need to be really great advisors and support their clients in terms of pursuing their own dreams. So it's a great place to work. I've been fortunate to have some, you know, good twists and turns in my career and happy to share my perspective today about where we're going and what the future looks like. It's a great perspective, clearly impressive career. And yes, we can punt on Notre Dame versus Michigan to another conversation or perhaps the end, but uh, a Butler yeah, well, Bulldog we at least, as well. We could at least save it till football season, right? Like yeah, exactly right. Football. Exactly right. right. Well, appreciate the context. It's always important to look back before we go forward. It seems like your career progression took a natural flow, right? You chose things that you gravitated towards or maybe were naturally naturally good at from the, from the onset. Oftentimes when you dig in, it's not always like that. Tell us a little bit more. Was it very intentional and intentionally drawn out? Did you overcome obstacles along the way? Like what led you to those decisions to take on specific roles throughout your career? Yeah, well, it, you know, it's a great question. And I would say, you know, I'm naturally curious, like new things have been interested in growing and developing. And I think one, one bit of advice I'd have for your listeners, people often ask me about sort of career progression. And I say, the one thing that you can do is if you're really great where you are, uh, you're likely to have more options because people will notice you and think you're a high performer. And so to your point about whether my career moves were intentional, I would say largely, although if you would have asked me, you know, 20 years ago, if I'd be in the job that I'm in right now, I'd say you're crazy. Like, I don't know how that would happen. But, but I think in terms of the big career moves, so the first one that I would call out was my decision to leave private practice and relocate from Chicago to Milwaukee. Again, I mentioned it was partly business and partly personal. My wife and I had just started a family. I was thinking about what life was going to look like. Where were we going to be in five years and 10 years? And I just didn't like the path that I was on at the law firm. I loved the work. I loved the people, but it wasn't what I wanted to do forever. And again, I felt like I learned a lot, but I felt like I had kind of like was where I was going to get to. And I had an opportunity to join Northwestern Mutual. And what was appealing to me there, first of all, I was, you know, maybe sometime before we talk about work-life balance, I was thinking about work-life balance and making sure I could have the home life 
community involvement and the life at work that were going to be important to me. And my work as a lawyer, what I found most fulfilling was when I had the opportunity to work really closely with business leaders on strategy in the future. As a litigator, you don't get to do that very much. You're mostly working on things that happened four years ago or five years ago or 10 years ago. And so my intuition was, you know, you asked if it was intentional. I, I'd say I had, a, I had an instinct that if I got to do more of that, I would like it. And I have to tell you, I knew right away that I made a great choice when I joined Northwestern Mutual. I actually took a fairly healthy pay cut to do it, but it wasn't really about that. It was really about having the career I wanted and the life I wanted. And the values of the organization suited me very well. And fortunately, Northwestern Mutual is a kind of company that doesn't pigeonhole you. Even though I was a lawyer, I knew I would have opportunities if they presented themselves in other parts of the business. And so I was super curious. I got staffed on some great assignments and had some great mentors who really helped me get visibility and exposure in the company. And then when I had an opportunity to leave the law department, th that would be another big inflection point for me. I don't know if I felt like I was ready. I mean, I probably felt like I was like in over my head taking on a, a junior executive role, but I knew I wanted to do it. It was a risk I was willing to take because I thought I can contribute as a business leader. And so again, I think I got great coaching and mentoring and support, but I was also willing to take the risk when it presented itself. And so, I, and I've enjoyed the versatility, I guess, of moving around the company and doing different things. That's been part of what I've enjoyed about the career journey here. It's a really helpful context and, you know, eye-opening in a lot of ways for folks who are sitting there thinking like, you know, I have to do these steps in order to get this job. And really, I think your calculated decision to pursue the life you wanted over the job that you must have is something that's really interesting. And I hope we touch on throughout the, the conversation as well, as we, you know, at Ramp try to guide people towards career paths that they really truly want or desire, like right away, a lot of times folks early in, you know, mid and even late in their careers, don't think about like, what's the life I want versus, you know, what's the dollar amount I need, or what's the dollar amount I want, or what's the you know, keeping up the, with the Joneses title that I, that I need to have. So a lot of times that's lost in the fact that, you know, we're all human and we are all driving our own careers and we have wants, needs, desires, and, and interests outside of necessarily like a day-to-day -day career standard progression. Yeah. And I, I'd be happy to dive into that more, but, but I appreciate you calling that out. And I think that's right. You know, I, I looked intentionally at the people that were five to 10 years ahead of me at the law firm and said, do I want to do that? And if not, why not? And it really made me reflect on what was important to me. And my other, you know, maybe calculus there, or advice I'd have for your listeners is I made the point before around values. You know, you spend a lot of time at work and I think you're going to be better in your job if you're connected to the purpose and mission of what you do. But I also think you're gonna be better in your job if your values align. I think it's very hard to be sort of one person at work and one person at home. And so I wanted a place, like I knew I, I thought I would be able to be at my best if I was at a place where the sort of the value system aligned. And I've been very fortunate to find that at Northwestern Mutual, but I'd encourage your listeners, I think that's worth pursuing. Yeah, it's, it's great advice. And NM obviously is, is a breeding ground for, for leaders, for business operators, for strategists, for salespeople. They're doing something right and have been for almost 200 years. So it seems like a great breeding ground for, for a lot of high performing and really, really talented folks. Digressing a little bit, I do want to get back to the future of work. Really the high level question is what does the, the future of work look like, you know, in the next five years and maybe five to 20 years? Well, that, that's like a big, broad question, but one of the things, you know, certainly, you know, we can talk about compensation in the economy. We can talk about mobility and flexibility. We can talk about technology, technical skills, and data. I think all of those things are important. We could dig into all of them, but sort of the two things that I would emphasize, and one I've mentioned a number of times already, and it's this connection to purpose and values. You know, when I have the opportunity to talk to a lot of young people, we recruit a couple thousand new advisors every year. And so one of the things that I think maybe keeps me young in the business, if you will, as I spend a lot of time with people who are early career. And I am, I always enjoy, I am excited when I see people with sort of that sparkle in their eye about like the mission of the organization and the purpose and what they want to accomplish. And those are the people that I would bet on all day long. And I think young people are very hungry for it. You know, you can like, you know, what's the saying, you know, money doesn't buy happiness or there's all these other things you can chase. You mentioned keeping up with the Joneses. I think this generation appreciates there's more to life than that. And so I think connecting, I think organizations that can connect with people are on mission and purpose 
have a huge advantage in this economy because I think young people are looking for that more than ever before. The other thing that I think is interesting, and I think this is still playing out as we, you know, hopefully exit the pandemic or in an endemic stage or whatever you want to call it, is this importance of personal connection. You know, while there are certainly opportunities to work remotely and we've uh, benefited from the efficiency of being able to do that, especially our advisors who can keep more meetings. I think more than anything for me, it's heightened the importance of, of being part of a team, of being able to have the connection to place to purpose, to teams, to other people. And I think, you know, if, if we're truly in a war for talent that's gonna persist, I think the winning companies are gonna be the ones that can build that culture and community. And there's an aspect of inclusivity. You know, we talk a lot about diversity and inclusion. I think that inclusive culture piece is really important because people wanna bring their whole selves to work. And I talked about aligning values. You wanna be in a place where you feel valued and accepted and can grow to your potential, whatever that is. And so I think organizations that are really intentional about creating that sense of place and purpose and community have a huge advantage. And again, I'm, I'm happy to talk about other things, technical skills and other things that I think matter, but I think organizationally, the future of work has to do with a lot of those things too. Yeah, I, I really love it. I love the direction you, you took it. And I think purpose has been something that I've seen specifically over the last 10 or so years be incredibly important when folks early, middle, late career are choosing what role they go to next. And a lot of times the purpose and, you know, the financial compensation isn't always aligned and people are making decisions, you know, based on purpose being the primary one. And that's, and that's great. And you hear a lot of it more, more recently than not. But what I'm, what I'm thinking is when you when you connect to purpose, you do find yourself working amongst folks who are more motivated or more driven, who think about their role or their work as, you know, building something bigger than themselves. And it's rare that you find organizations, and M is, is, is one of them, but it's rare that you find organizations that really can connect that dot. And what I've seen on the output is motivated workers. And I think as the world changes, there are going to be more of these mission driven, mission focused companies and smaller niches, but really this cohort of vast support for those smaller niches, like almost kind of like gig economy plus where folks now get to develop individual interests and surround themselves with their tribe. Well, I, I think it's a really interesting, I don't know if you'd call it a dichotomy or a paradox, but I think people are looking for independence and autonomy in a lot of cases. And we certainly see that with our advisors who are essentially starting small businesses. And I think there's, you, I'm sure seeing the research and the data, and there's a lot that suggests that this coming generation is very interested in entrepreneurialism and sort of not being defined like in a small, narrow way. On the other hand, I also see, you know, what I talked about before, and you mentioned connection to something bigger than yourself. So it's like, they want both, right? You want the ability to not be micromanaged or told how to think or <laughs> what to do. But on the other hand, you want to be part of something that's of significance, that matters, that's bigger than yourself. And, and I think organizations who can facilitate that are going to be in a really good position. And it's a, it's a tough balancing act to be able to do both of those things at the same time, but I think it can be done. And we work on doing that with our advisors. But the other, the other thing that occurred to me as you were sort of playing the question back to me that I think is really important is the opportunity to grow and learn and develop. And so if there's one thing that I think is not going to change, that is there's going to be a lot of change. It's a very fast paced environment. People have to be comfortable dealing with ambiguity. As I said, my job today is nothing what I thought it would have looked like 20 years ago. And when we survey our employees, our home office employees about what they want, one of the things that always rises to the top are development and career path. And so for people who are thinking about where they're starting out, it might be starting salary or what kind of work you're, be do, you're going to be doing. Those things all matter. But I think also having an eye ahead of where you're going and what are the opportunities to develop your skill set and learn, those are the things that are really going to position you well for success over the long term. And I, and I think that's, you know, that's part of the fun of leadership. It's lifelong learning. Totally, totally. Totally think those are great concepts throughout. And yeah, it is, it is interesting to watch this. I don't want to be micromanaged. I want to work for myself, but I also want connection. All those things playing out leads me kind of into my next question, which is the, the future of work tag or, or hearing about all this change today, sparked maybe by the pandemic, sparked maybe by something else a little bit ahead of the, or before the pandemic and really like 
catalyzed in this recent period of work from home remote life. But wh why do you think people are obsessing about the future of work today? Why has it become such a hot topic or buzzwordy? Or is it just, you know, folks don't have enough to, to label it and, and everything's bucketed into it? You know, why, why do you think that that tailwind is happening? I, I think that's a great question. And there's probably not a, a very specific answer to it. But, but I think your comment that sort of what's going on in the pandemic and coming out of it has contributed to it. And I, and I think generally speaking, uh, times of crisis accelerate change. And the pandemic brought with it a lot of things there. You know, we've had political strife and social strife and certainly like just the medical sort of nature of the pandemic. People were more anxious. All of those things, I think, accelerate change. And as companies adapted in different ways, we saw lots of different ways of doing work. And so we see people working from their basements or from Costa Rica or changing jobs or whatever, or the great resignation, as it's been called. And I, and I think what it's made people realize is the future of what's possible is different than what the past was. And there are fewer like sharp edges to what that will look like. Things are changing, but people don't exactly know where it's going. And I think fundamentally, and I think this is why the point around purpose and values matter so much, is I think it's really made people reevaluate what matters most to them. And we see this with our clients who are planning for their financial lives. People have been more willing to talk to an advisor They've been more willing to take action because they don't want to wait. They feel a sense of urgency. And I think the same thing is true from a career perspective where people don't want to wait 10 years to figure out what's important to them. Like you don't know what's going to happen in 10 years. So I think people are thinking very intentionally now, they're kind of inventory. What do they want in a job? What do they want in life? Where do they want to live? What, you know, all of those key relationships. And so it's unsettling. I think that people are like sorting all of those things out because you get a lot of uncertainty. But I think it's also exciting because it gives people the opportunity to think about and then really pursue intentionally. What is it that matters most to them? It's a great call out. It's a great call out. I think you're right in a lot of ways. You know, there's still the, you know, we, we talk tailwinds, but great resignation is certainly one of them. And I think it's going to be very interesting to watch how this next, for sure, one to three year period shakes out. And then five to 10, we'll get it. We'll get interesting. Well, I feel like things will kind of hardened by that point in time. Go yeah, and I, well, and I was just going to add, I think the other thing is, you know, companies are choosing to compete in different ways. Yep. Some are competing on salary, some are competing on flexibility, some are competing on culture. And so I think it also gives companies a, really a range of opportunity too to define what they want the future to look like. And so I think all of that, you know, there's a lot of possibility in all that. It's a total, total great statement. It brings up another point that I've been toying with, especially as somebody who, you know, we're, we're building career pathways for early career folks. One of them is sales. I have a, I'm of the strong opinion that sales will not be something that is automated away, but there's tons of articles and blog posts saying that the, uh, the future of salespeople <laughs> is bleak. I'm curious to know from your perspective, what types of roles could be automated away? What roles are definitely here to stay? What roles are somewhere in between? And we don't know. Yeah, well, great, great question, Danny. And you might not be surprised, but I agree with you on this one. You know, I, I don't think the role of the human advisor salesperson is is going to be done away with because of technology. Although certainly it's, it's actually fun to kind of look back at the top 10 lists from, you know, years ago of which jobs were going to be disrupted. And I think a lot of people thought, oh, financial advisor, that's something you get a robo and an algorithm and, you know, anybody with a computer or a smartphone, they're good. Who needs, you know, who needs to pay whatever? And I think it's actually turned out to be quite the opposite of that. You know, I mentioned our research shows that people are more inclined to seek advice now. And I think in fields where there's any kind of technical complexity, people want guidance and advice. They want a coach. They want reassurance. I mean, even, I mean, even just look at how people manage their health, like more people are getting personal trainers or other things, because you know, not only do you want someone who's sort of smarter than you about that, but you want the accountability and a partner that you can check in with. Now, I, I don't think people entirely want to delegate that and not know what's going on. So I think there's kind of this collaboration that needs to happen between clients and advisors, but I think there's a really important role for the in-person advisor to play. And we, the, some of the research actually is, is pretty interesting of late. I just saw something recently that said basically almost everybody who is using an advisor would be happy to keep using an advisor and would not rely on just technology. On the other hand, people who are using robo would be very interested in talking to somebody about advice. And actually, if you follow the progression of robo advisors, most of them now offer some access to human advice. 
because yep. people just want the reassurance if they're going to make an important an important decision or a decision of any consequence. So I think really the opportunity and where we're focused at Northwestern Mutual, and I think other companies are too, is how do you leverage technology to make your advisors even better? Because to your point, there are some things that technology can do, you know, if it's basic calculations or even now with AI and machine learning, their technology can save advisors and their staffs and teams a ton of time and effort of understanding their clients, of understanding like what are the areas of greatest opportunity with things like propensity modeling. And so ultimately where we want our advisors to be playing is in the, ma is in the moments that matter the most. And, or maybe thought of another way, technology should enable advisors to deliver a really personalized experience, but at scale. Because it's time consuming, right? To know your client and have everything ready and organized for the meeting and all the follow-up. But to the extent you can have technology take some of those things off the plate of the advisor, it frees the advisor up to do what only they can do. And that's connect with the client on a really personal way. And the, the one other thing I would add on this that has sort of resonated with me, we've seen it a lot in financial services, particularly in insurance. You see a lot of window shopping online, but you don't see a lot of action. People are scared to actually pull the trigger unless they have a trusted expert. And I think, to, so to me, that has me very bullish on the future of advice and the future of advisors, but also really committed to thinking about how can we leverage technology or even services and support to make those advisors even better? So to sum that all up, I think the future is about digitally enabled advisors as opposed to robo advice. Yeah, I love it. I love it. I think that pretty much hits my key point of how I think about the future of sales, selling advice, whatever you want to call it, whatever you want to bucket in consultative advices. There's yeah. so much information out there right now. The buyer can actually make a really informed decision, but oftentimes they're stymied at that tail end because they just need that guidance of somebody who's done it before outside of like reviews they see online or a click button that shows the benefits you're going to get for something, especially with these big ticket purchases. Like you're probably not going to buy a house or put your entire life savings in a software that's just going to automate it for you. That, that seems daunting that if it, if it feels really, really daunting, that's when you're going to need somebody like, you know, an NM advisor or like a, a salesperson for, I, I don't mean that negatively or in, in a cliche way, like somebody who's going to help guide you through this decision. Yeah, absolutely. And I think your point about all the information that's out there, the, the amount of information out there is actually contributing to, I think, the need for advice because it's so hard to know. There's so much noise. There are so many competing voices out there. I think increasingly consumers are figuring like, hey, I can't figure out what of this online stuff I should be listening to. I have to have someone who can help me navigate that noise. And so I think that's why there will be a premium on advisors who can create trust because that's the difference, right? Like, do you trust the person enough to actually follow their advice? Or is it just like another online source that's interesting, but maybe just, you know, doesn't actually help, you know, help you chart a path forward? Yeah, so it's, it's a great call out. And something that, you know, leads right into the next question I have for you. We've talked about it a good amount on this podcast, but so, so if that's the case, and if there's going to be folks who are going to help and guide and advise, like what does the future of, I say this in quotes, but I mean it more generally, like what does the future of sales actually look like to you? Well, I, I think for us, as we think about from an organizational perspective, you know, we've, we've got to do a couple things. Number one is we have to make sure that our advisors are, are equipped to be the most trusted advisors out there. Because I think trust is really the currency for advisors. It's really in their ability to build relationships. So we've got a national training program and a leadership development curriculum and lots of opportunities for mentoring and joint work, which is sort of a form of like learning the business and apprentice. We're starting more models that are team-based instead of individual-based so that people can learn on a team, just like I learned, you know, as an associate at a law firm. And so I think there's part of this that's about enabling the professional development of the advisors so that they can be skilled at building relationships and providing great advice. I mean, it's, you know, a technically complex world out there. People have to know whether it's insurance, investments, wealth management, planning, estate planning, they have to be skilled. So I think part of what we have to do is make sure that our advisors are well-skilled to be the most trusted advisor. But the other piece of that is we have to be providing them with um, 
the rich digital experience and support so that they can be really efficient in town in terms of how they grow a successful business. You know, for our advisors, you know, we're essentially competing out there for the world that's looking for independent advisors or RIAs or wealth managers or whatever. I need to make sure that Northwestern Mutual is the best place for them to grow a business. So we're investing in our platforms for them, like the ease of use of technology, the support they have financially or otherwise to help grow their business in a more efficient way, support around staffing and HR kinds of services. I, I think increasingly the future of advice will look like that. And then the other side of it, of course, is we have to make sure we have a really compelling client experience. Because if our advisors aren't delivering something of value to their clients, they're not relevant. And so we've really been investing. We've always had amazing products. We've for a long time been the strongest company in the industry. We've spent a lot of time now investing in our digital experience for our clients and our planning experience, because we need to make sure that our, that our advisors in essence have the ability to, you know, be relevant and win in the marketplace. And so, you know, I think, you know, that's how we think about equipping our advisors to be really successful in the future. And I think, you, you know, you could probably extrapolate from that in terms of like, what, it, what does that look like across the board? But I think you want advisors who have great EQ in the ability to connect. They need to have technical competence, but then they also have to be supported by the platform that allows them to deliver. Yeah, all good things. And clearly, NM is ahead of the game in thinking about what the future looks like and equipping folks. And I think the thing that you mentioned that it resonates the most. There's a ton of really good tactics in there. And I agree with the customer experience, but that trust factor, that is part of, you know, the customer experience as well. Like if folks don't trust the advice they're getting or trust the person they're working with, this whole thing just kind of collapses on it. And I think that's one of those things that whatever the future of work looks like, that will be key. I agree hundred percent. Awesome. But last question for you before we wrap is. So now that we have kind of some frameworks in place to talk through and think through the future of work, where do folks go to learn a little bit more about the future of work or who are some of the folks that you admire when talking or thinking about the future of work? Well, I'll answer that one, but I, I want to double down on the point you just made about trust because we talked about employers and future work. It matters there too. You know, we ask our employees all the time, do they, do they feel like trust and transparency from the company, from senior management, from whatever. And I think in this environment, you know, where you have so many different competing voices out there, you want to be trusted to your, by your clients, but also by your employees. And so I talked before about values and culture. I think this idea of operating in a way that's trustworthy, high transparency, high integrity is really important in terms of workplace of the future, because like there are no secrets, right? In this world, like stuff always like, so. I think people want to be with companies who don't feel like they have to hide the ball, but they're really upfront and transparent about who they are. In terms of future of work, you know, one, one thinker, and this might not be where you think I would take this question, but one person who's been really influential to me is a guy named John Picard. John Picard is one of the lead design architects at Picard Chilton. We worked with him. I actually had the privilege of partnering with him very closely about a decade ago as we were designing our new corporate campus in downtown Milwaukee. And he's a visionary, not just as an architect, but about thinking about the importance of a sense of place for a company employee. So what does the workspace of the future look like? How do you create spaces that invite collaboration and engagement and creativity? What's the importance of natural light? What's the importance of proximity or connectivity to nature in the natural world. And so, you know, I, I think it just made me think more expansively as a leader about what it means to create a great environment, because I think the future of work is made up by lots of things, but including the physical space. And ironically, you know, and we spent a couple of years where our building was largely empty, which was not a lot of fun, but I think that space is even more important to us now at Northwestern Mutual, because as you're trying to invite people back to the workspace after they've been used to working at home, and all the things that go with that, having a phenomenal place for them to come and be together and feel like they're going to be here because this is where their colleagues are. This is where the leaders of the company are. This is where they do their best work, I think is super important. And so, you know, as you think about future work, certainly, you know, there are business leaders and others, you know, who are, have important informed opinions. But I think for us, us also to think more broadly about all of the things that go into a great workspace and great work environment, there are lots of places I think where we can find influence and inspiration. Yeah, it's great. It's great. Yeah. I will get a chance to check him out before this episode launches and definitely include him in the show notes, but that's a great call out. The physical space is often forgotten. I think 
the beginning of the pandemic, I don't know how you were, but I was essentially working on my bedroom on like a fold up desk. And I've since increased, you know, the, 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 the good feeling of this room, you know, obviously that the, the Michigan, the Michigan stuff, I got pictures of my family. I got a big window in front of me. So there's, there's a yeah. ton of, a ton of improvements and the physical space is just super important, especially if folks transition back to, to the, to the workplace as well. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Tim, this has been a really, really thoughtful and, you know, thoughtful discussion and, and your advice is on point across the board. You've clearly thought about the future of work and how folks can level up and really think through some of the challenges and opportunities ahead. We obviously truly appreciate having you on the podcast. Before I let you go, where can folks find you? I would say check out my profile on LinkedIn. You know, I, I put a lot of stuff out there on a regular basis. And if people want to join in on the network, that would be awesome. But I think LinkedIn is probably the best place to find me. And thanks again for the great conversation. I really enjoyed it and appreciated the opportunity to be together. Absolutely. Thank you so, so much. Thank to you. Thanks to NM. And uh, we will certainly be back on the Ramp podcast in the, in the near future. Great. Thanks, Danny.